I, I've been wanting to get your uh, take on this. I don't if you're if you're gonna do a show on it, please save it for the show. But I'm curious your thoughts about race in the NBA MVP. <laughs> All right, it's another edition of Hoops Adjacent on the Athletic NBA show. We took last week off because we were all tired. David Aldridge here in D.C., Marcus in the Bay, and our man with with the subtle flex in the background. <laughs> Y'all see it? Y'all see it? This is like that Patrice O'Neal. It's like that Patrice O'Neal skit where he says, "I just want to have a I want to have a white slave in my bed." <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bo, we on with a legend, man. We made we made it, huh? <laughs> hey man, David Aldridge is the legend. You that's know? what I'm saying. We all were the legend out of, <laughs> out of Clark Atlanta. We own David. I that's what no I'm saying. Emmys. I have no it, Emmys man. of any kind in my house. I don't no. even have people named Emmy in my house. I got nothing. But Bo Jones, Bomani Jones has an Emmy, the host of Game Theory with Bomani Jones. I have I have not been able to ask you this on HBO, HBO Max. Y'all know about it. Is that based? on the actual game theory or is that a play on the actual game theory how did you come up with that yeah it was just we were bouncing around names and me with the economic stuff and all of that it it, it wound up being as much as anything just kind of a play on like the sports overlap but also <clears throat> i think if you go through and check a lot of the stuff we're talking about it really does just come back to game theory right incentives and you know, like how incentives motivate people to do certain things explains just about everything that we wind up talking about there. So it's like a double, triple entendre to someone right now, you know? <laughs> you know what's funny, Bo? I was, I was watching the news today, this morning, and every story that they had, you know, they had the mass shooting in Tennessee. They had the tornadoes in, in Mississippi. There was another story about, uh, I can't remember what it was. And I was just sitting there thinking, this is the summation of all human failure in the last 25 years of our existence. We've just failed miserably at all the important <laughs> stuff. Like we are terrible. <laughs> We're awful at everything that, that was of matter that was important. We have screwed it up. We just yeah, we blew it over. <laughs> we blew it, man. The capitalism won so tough, man. Like yeah. just the across the board blanket capitalism won in such a way that, yeah, it's going to be a tough road to hoe here uh, right. for a little while as we look at all of this. The climate stuff always gets me because it's just like you had to know this stuff was a bad idea. And everybody's like, well, I'm only going to live for 70 years. Like they'll, they'll work it out. All they all fall. This, huh? this, right. thing, this thing about to be smoldering, Jack. Right. Smoldering. Bro, the salt lake is gone. Like, Yo, how crazy is that? There's no like, salt bro. lake. It's gone. No salt lake. <laughs> Right. In like three and a half weeks, people are going to be like, why did they call this place Salt Lake City? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> like, you know where all that garbage is that we dump now? Yeah, it used to be a lake. Dude, it's unbelievable. And the carcinogens that were at the bottom of the lake because there's no more lake are now in the air and everybody's getting sick in Salt Lake City. It'll be City. like a dust bowl. Yeah. Yo, like, that's God. a scary thing. Like all this stuff where like the permafrost is thawing in all these places and it's some old school viruses that had frozen over and we ain't have to worry about no more oh no nah, dog they back around they coming now. up like han solo baby they just... <laughs> Bo, you know it's uh, the to me the best thing about game theory is like you it feels like you're like getting in your bag as like a comedian and you 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 have a different kind of funny it's like situational it's like not overt it's like your hilarity is like a certain way uh, how, on this is it more are you doing more like written lines like how, how, how is this type of funny manifested for the show you know it's been an evolution over the two seasons in that because when i first talked to these people about doing the show my first thing i told them was i am not a comedian like i'm not gonna be able to that's a hard 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 job like showing up and telling a joke that you prepared is the hardest thing in the world to do on television. Like, if you think about any given sitcom, my buddy Nick Wright talks about this. If you laugh out loud three times during a 30-minute sitcom, they've done a pretty good job, right? Like, it's it's right. really hard to do. And there's nothing worse than trying to be funny and not be funny, especially when people see you as a person that's not inclined to do such a thing. So at first, when we started doing this, this was so far afield of anything I'd done before, I was a lot more deferential to what people put in front of me, unless it was just something I just absolutely would never say. Like, this is not going to come out of my mouth. And so we came back around this season 
And one thing was, hey, we got to be more comfortable with if something's not funny, we don't have to be funny. We're not obligated to tell jokes, right? Again, I am not a comedian. Therefore, you don't have that force that you're required to do that. And then I'm like, if you go watch Oliver or Bill Maher, they'll go two, three, four minutes sometimes without saying anything funny. Like if it lands, it lands. And comedy people, that's that's the club they have, right? Like imagine like what if, if your job in golf was I only drive. All I got here is this driver, right? They've got a driver. I got a lot more clubs. And so you got to figure out, you know, how to do that. And so to start this season, I was like, I want as few words in the teleprompter as possible. Give me bullet points so I can kind of like play around with it. But that doesn't work on television, right? Like you say something, you can't get your timing right. right like you say right, something right. that's supposed to be funny. They don't laugh. I get scared and I start running into something else to talk about or whatever it is. And so I feel like a setup. Yeah. You know <laughs> what I mean? And so, and so we decided this season, we got me a performance coach to help me get better at the teleprompter. But what it really turned out to be was an acting coach as much like knowing how to lay into this, how to lay into that. And then for me to communicate to my writers in meetings, when we talk about what we're going to do, how to figure out what that thing is that's like what you talk about, right? Like it ain't gonna be no long setup joke or whatever it is, but like what's yeah. that quick thing? And then figure out how to get that on the page where I can tell it. So like I was real proud in our ninth episode where we had this line about Dylan Brooks and somebody else had written the first part of it was like, if Dylan Brooks can fight, then how come his braids so perfect? And then we're like, you got to have shaggy braids in order for me to think, Man. like, look at Frizzy this guy. as hell, and right? Then we, and then we put up a picture of Kawhi Little with his shaggy braids. And like, he'd be over there not saying a word, whooping your ass with them heavy hands. You know, but like, that's the type of stuff I think that you're talking about there. And it's like figuring out how to make sure everybody understands and trusts me. Or like, look, let me try to do this thing. If it doesn't work, we'll record a pickup and clean it up with whatever the thing is that you've had. But I've gotten so much more comfortable not feeling like I got to talk so loud to the person in the back of the room, which then makes it harder to get the right level, like in tone of voice and all of this. Like it's, it's a much more technical process um, than I thought it would be. And I think in some ways I had to convince the professional funny people that my regular people funny can translate to television if we set it up right. It, it, I'm fascinated by that notion of, of a writer's room because it's <clears> – <throat> boy, these are professional comedians, right? Like this, they do this to feed their families and, but they have to find your voice and your sensibility for it to work. And it, whether it's, whether it's Richard Pryor's writers back in the day or Johnny Carson's writers or David Letterman, they have to get that guy's voice or it doesn't work. So how is that process going? It has been a challenge if I'm being perfectly honest. And it's been a challenge because it's going to be challenging, right? Like it's not, I don't think it's necessarily particular to everybody on the staff. Like there's some guys like my guy, Rod, who's been, you know, I've known him for like 15 years. I got him. He's great to have. I got Tommy Craggs on staff, which is great because he's not there to be a comedy writer. He's there for the other kind of voice, right? Like I need to bring a flamethrower. I need somebody with a bigger gun than I got. And I got the biggest gun maybe I've ever read in sports, you know, behind me there. But for the rest, yeah, it's a matter where I think it's a challenge for the writers, to be fair, is normally when they get a job like this, they're like finding the voice of the person, but the person they're writing for typically doesn't have a clear point of view. And everything that we do starts from my point of view. So God forbid what you're supposed to do if you don't agree, whatever this is that I'm coming out here with, you got to write it, right? You got to, right. you know, you've got to figure that stuff out. But the other thing that I've learned in the course of this is I've done a lot of things over the years that come from a lot of perspectives. And also I think have a lot of different like emotional directions that we could go in. Like it's evocative in different ways, but what people like about you is typically what they think you are. So the person that thinks I'm so deep thinks that you got to write for me by being so deep. The person that thinks, Oh, the black guy's funny, go write by what they think a black funny person is. You see what I'm saying? And then they got to do that. And so it, it can often be difficult to get people right. to understand the range of things and how to tell when I want to go in this direction or when I want to go in that direction or where it might be this. And that's a lot to ask out of them. So we try to do as much as possible going in to guide people like, hey, this is what I'm feeling about this. I got these other side thoughts that might be good. And if you think it's something that we should land on, it should be done. But I try my best going in, no matter what the topic is, to give them as clearly as possible what I'm thinking and let them hear like some of the jokes that might come up naturally as I'm just talking about it in the room. And then these other people can supplement it and make the things better in some ways that I wouldn't be able um, to do by myself. But now it's a struggle. I think the hardest part for me with the writer's room is 
it can be difficult, I think, to figure out like where we land things. Like every story we do, I want there to be like a zag where you think you know where we're going. But oh no, it's actually this other thing that's just as important and was right there next to it. Right. It's a lot to ask somebody else to think of what that thing is in the way that I would think of what that thing is. But we just had a script we did for our ninth episode, which is about the women's NCAA tournament. And I handed that one over completely to two writers. And it was their idea. It was like their viewpoint. I then got in and tweaked it and figured out like, okay, what you know things are that I would want to say, but it was a topic where I was not the most knowledgeable. And it would have been wildly insulting for me to look at these two women who clearly knew more about this than I did to be like, I'll take it from here, girls. Nah, nah, nah. We just got to figure out how to make what y'all talking about sound in a way that I would say it. Today's show is brought to you by Chime. Visit chime.com slash NBA show for more information. What's the first thing you do when you wake up? Is it checking up on your credit score? Yeah, I didn't think so. Well, at Chime, that's exactly what they do for you. With their secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start to build credit with your own money. Chime reports your payments to credit bureaus to help you build credit over time. Their members see an increase of 30 points on average. All of this with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. So start your credit journey with Chime. Sign up only takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash MBA show. That's Chime.com slash NBA show. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank in a pursuant to a license from Visa USA Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact to score may vary and some user scores may not improve. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply except at MoneyPass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. Probably the most hilarious episode. I don't even know if y'all tried to do this. I wasn't sure if it was scripted or not. That's how funny it was. It was the Jake Paul. Like, <laughs> tell me that was tell me that was just live ingenuity. Yeah. On... No, 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 no. <laughs> None of that was contrived. Like, I, I will hope, I will hope people would know enough about me to know that I'm not going to engage in an actual dog and pony show. It was too perfect, though. It was just too perfect. It was <laughs> There's so much there's so much that went on with that that I can't say, but I do think this is the part that people lose sight of. But they're like, ah, oh, Jake Paul knew who you were. No, I don't think he did, to be fair. And I'm not offended by that. He's like 24 years old or something like that. You right, know, he, right, right, like, right, he maybe he wasn't sitting around with his pops watching around the horn or whatever. I don't think he's like the biggest sports fan in the world. It's totally possible he had no idea who, who I was. What I didn't understand is why he thought I would find that to be insulting. Like, you don't yeah, know who that I is am. the funny part, right? Yeah, <laughs> oh, right. Okay, got it. Well, damn, yeah. you know, like you're 24 How did he not old. understand that would be a boon to your reputation? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but like people that age don't realize, maybe he didn't think I'm, I'm as old as I am, right? Like, no, nah, young man, you don't know who I am. That's okay, young man. Like, that's what I wanted to do when he started breaking bad with me was hit him with a, excuse me, young man. I would prefer if you got to You got to go young fellow. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little buddy, you know? Son, I'm going to tell you this one time. <laughs> Bo, is there a... Uh, I've been wanting to get your uh, take on this. I don't, if you're, if you're going to do a show on it, please save it for the show. But I'm curious your thoughts about race in the NBA MVP. <laughs> like, Yo, so this... we did something on it um, a couple weeks ago about the... On the... Perk and JJ. Right, right, right. Going yeah. back and forth. Okay. So there's so many more levels that I could in, than I could engage in in the limited time frame that I had there. This is where this gets interesting to me. And you guys cover the NBA, follow the NBA, been around basketball. There's one thing that I think you guys understand. Overall, nobody is harder on white basketball players than white people. White people. Absolutely. No right, right. No there's, there's a there's a there's a there's a low no self-esteem question. inside when it comes to basketball that manifests itself in a self-hatred. Except when that white dude turns out to be good. And once then that white dude that, turns out to be over. good, or at the very least, just a little charming, see Austin Reeves, Matthew Della right, 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 like right, right. all of these types, right? Then there's like Grayson Allen who nobody likes, so he might be the most the only underrated white player ever. But like when they get to that fan favorite point. 
it starts getting to go a little too far. I think it goes too far with Luka Doncic, who I think is a very, very, very good player with, with a type of game that I think a lot of his acolytes would be far more critical of, of if course. he was a different person, right? Yeah, yeah. But the Jokic thing, the people who were saying Jokic by far, I think there's a race element to it perhaps, but not as a like favoring Jokic as much as the people who lean really hard on the analytics tend to be white dudes. And they yeah. tend to be white dudes who all hang out with each other. Like it's those podcasts. That Echo you go chamber. Listen. Yeah, it's those podcasts that you go listen to if you white and you like basketball, but you just don't really have to want to have to think about the black people for a little <laughs> while. Like you can go check. But, you know, it's like it winds up being all that whole crew of people that are trumpeting Jokic and they keep talking about advanced numbers as if triple-double average and shooting 60% from the floor <laughs> wouldn't be enough, right? Well, but, yeah, yeah. You know, they all go there. And then if you're from the outside, and you just hear it's all these white dudes who keep telling you about this dude who don't really look like your concept of a great basketball player and how great he is. And then when you try to push back on it, tell you that you're too stupid to understand the advanced numbers or anything else, then those people are likely to believe that there's a racial dynamic that undergirds the origin of it with Jokic. Mm -hmm. The problem is, at least at the time that this discussion got started, he was having one of the 10 greatest regular seasons <laughs> in the history of the NBA. <laughs> like, like, like there's just, yes, defensive win shares are a stat that's a bit skewed and give you a lot of credit for rebounding and everything else. That's fine. I totally get you. But are you watching this? I've never seen anything like this before with this dude. And so Embiid may go down as three-time back-to-back runner-up MVP and all of those years were MVP caliber years and other times. Kevin Durant in 2013 had an MVP caliber year that he did not win it because LeBron James had one of the 10 greatest seasons of all time. Like occasionally this happens, but I do think, and this was my point about JJ when I brought it up on Game Theory, you can't be out here talking down to people when you try to make this point and be like, there's absolutely no racial bias. Oh, don't... Oh, don't yeah. ever say that. How can you do that in America? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So oh, happy, okay. homie. I was that with you for a minute there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> don't, you know, don't go there. Like, I don't think, I don't think it's ever an unfair question to ask, but I didn't think that the answer was that race played a role in it. However, since then, MB took off, the Nuggets struggled, and quietly Kendrick Perkins for all the hell he caught, redirected the MVP race, and it is now far more competitive than it was. When no he question. made those statements, you know what's it's funny about that is that you, you're you're right about this in that in the sense that it's not. I will listen to anybody's argument, even if it's based on advanced numbers. But the the but the un but the there's always kind of a aftertaste to an to a to a discussion when you were when it's someone from the ad, ad, ad advanced stats community. The aftertaste is always. And if you don't agree with me, you're not smart enough to understand this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes. and it's like, wait a minute. I mean, I can I can appreciate Jokic. I think he's great. He's having a great season. But you have to acknowledge that if you look at a number like per eight of the last eight of the top twenty pers of all time have happened since 2015. <laughs> yes. Which means that these numbers are somewhat skewed. That's yes. all I'm saying. Yeah, this is definitely the juice ball error. Skewed. <laughs> and see, that number is interesting because I've never used it. I always felt like it was an index that didn't necessarily indicate anything. So case in point, uh, when the NCAA used to use RPI for the tournament right, field, right, and what right, they did right. was they just cooked up some numbers and you got a result at the end and it seemed like a good number. So you roll with it, a quarterback rating, not the new QBR stat, but the old quarterback rating in the NFL. It was the same way where I'm like, right. it, speaking in technical terms, so like, what is the dependent variable? Like, what are we solving for? What is this supposed right. to mean? <laughs> and nobody gives you a real answer. Like, I've got the ones that I kind of pick and choose. And really, win shares per 48 is the only one that I go to because mm -hmm. I feel like box score plus or minus doesn't really tell us anything. I mean, every stat is a stat. It's just yes. a stat. Yeah, that's all. Like, they're all tools. Like you know, what else is a stat? Points per game. Yeah, right? like, like like they're. Nah, all, you can't use that. You can't use that. That's out. No, that's out. Nah, but they're all tools. <laughs> I think the thing though that happens with Jokic, and this is the disconnect between the analytics community and the people who lean more toward qualitative measures, is that playoff basketball one is not the same as the basketball that you get from the eighty-two game sample. Like they're just there. There there are structural differences that matter. It's the same thing with football. 
they play the playoffs in the cold and outside and everything else. Like those numbers aren't as reflective. Like Rudy Gobert and the crazy advanced numbers that he could put up, they didn't translate into the postseason. Jokic to a degree, they haven't translated to the postseason. But what we do know matters in the postseason, even if not all the time. Take a guy like Trey Young, of whom I am not a big fan, but Trey Young's got that need a shot, got you. I can do that. And you need that in the playoffs. That's how they got to the conference right. finals because they right. had that guy that could do that thing. Jokic's game to me is not one that people look at as, all right, big fella, we're going to need you to go get 45 for us tonight. Can you do it? And the truth is he might be able to. It just hasn't happened. And when you start talking about a game that is so hinged upon getting the ball to other people, well, in the playoffs, are you really trusting those guys to hit those shots that they were hitting in the regular season? No, you going to have to be the one to do it. And I think people look at an Embiid or look at a Giannis and they see a guy that they think can impose his will on a game and thereby make it happen. They don't think that about Jokic. I think this year you're going to see it and it wouldn't shock me if he just had a two-month bananas run through this because he tired of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No question. I I am I, I'm also like the, the devaluation of certain triple doubles troubles you know what I mean? Like, like his Jokic's triple doubles are, are sacrosanct, but Russell Westbrook's ain't shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so that's like, come on. Like, okay, what I hate, what I love is, well, you know, he's just padding his stats by getting rebounds off of missed free throws. Did he get the rebound? <laughs> well, the problem that I had, I mean, with like, when he did get that, the rebound at the end of the day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, the problem I had with it when they were doing that with Russell was it was clear that Oklahoma City in particular was strategically boxing out to get into the fast break faster so that he could get the ball. Like, it, like there was there was an element to it. Now, it was worth noting if you looked at, like, Steven Adams' rebounding statistics after he left Oklahoma City, it was clear they were giving some rebounds no to question. Russell Westbrook. My problem, and this is something, you know, those of us of this age, <laughs> there's not a single person in the league for rebounding anymore. Like rebounding as its own particular skill has been so de-emphasized by the three-point shot because it's long rebounds. And that's how, we, like, Jokic has as many uh, triple doubles in his career now as LeBron James. That's crazy, right? That's a sign of the change right. of the game. Right. It's not, it's, you know, they're taking a lot more shots and everything else. That's about the change in the game. It isn't about all of a sudden these guys are just so much better at this, but I feel like the lean on analytics is removing accountability from everybody. Make your own decision, whether you be an executive, a media person, tell me what you actually think. Don't just tell me what comes off this page. Tell me what you think. So do I think Jokic has been the best player in the NBA for three straight regular seasons? Yes. Have I thought he's the best player in the NBA for those three seasons? No. No. You Him or Giannis, I'm taking Giannis. Him or Embiid, it gets tougher, but I'm probably still taking Embiid because he's a defensive vortex. Is there is there a, a crazier story this offseason than what's going on with Andrew Wiggins? And the like to put on your hat, I know you're a superstar now. Put on your journalism hat. How would you handle this? Because dude is just gone for like over a month. <laughs> look, and Marcus, you can tell this true story. People who know this, we didn't know each other like that. We was there, but me and Marcus went to college together, you know? And so when something happens with the Warriors that don't make sense to me, I hit Marcus up to be like, all right, let's 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 talk this through. Let's go. Let's and I'm like, all real. right. So it, every now and then I'm like, okay, right. cool. So I'm not crazy. Thank you, Marcus. Greatly appreciate it. This time I was like, you know what's going on with Wiggins? You're like, no, I just have heard crazy things. Nobody actually knows, but I have to assume it's something real because otherwise the Warriors ain't such good people that they wouldn't have started to sully his name by now about what's going on but i have no oh, facts facts it would have been it would have been all bad already <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and you know he's such an interesting story from top to bottom that i wish somebody would do like a full long feature on because i worry about these guys that are chasing their daddy's dreams and so i always when i say that in this case the first nba finals i ever remember are the nba finals in 1986 the rockets and the celtics and mitchell wiggins um Andrew's daddy was in those finals. Game five, remember, baby. Yeah, and then I remember <laughs> the next year I asked my daddy how come Mitchell Wiggins wasn't playing for the Rockets no more. It explained to me something about cocaine. Oh, and so, no. <laughs> yeah, so it was Mitch and Lou Lloyd, and they missed a couple years, and then Mitch got it back, and now they live in like some police suburb of Toronto. Um, and they had this son who, and this is, I think people have forgotten this, 
he's the last of the next LeBron Jameses was Andrew Wiggins. Like, that was the guy we thought. And he just ain't having like that. I don't think from a distance he even wants it like that. And so now he wound up in this place with the Warriors, and he wound up in the greatest situation ever, a place where you could be a $35 million number four option. And thereby your $35 million doesn't matter anymore, and nobody thinks of you in the context of that, and you win a championship while being the exact same player you always were. And so you cool. And now... He gone, and do the Warriors miss him, by the way? I feel like they play in the exact same without him as they did with him. Yeah. I think they miss him on defense. Well, yes, yes. They miss, I think they miss him on defense, and I feel like just any other person to make you have to deal with Jordan Poole less, I feel like, is what they really need in their little situation. It would, it would, they definitely – I think they get to the point now where it's like, all right, man, like you got about a week left. Right. We kind of we got to tighten up here. Somebody. Yeah, <laughs> where, where you at? You know what Jordan Poole is? Jordan Poole is like, what if people didn't like Mario Chalmers? <laughs> right? Like, you know, Jordan, did Jordan Poole try to go take that technical free throw with Clay on the court? Oh, right? and Clay bumped him off. Yeah, Clay yes. bumped him off. Absolutely. That is something <laughs> Mario Chalmers would do, and everybody would laugh because, of course, Mario Chalmers would do that. Right? Jordan Poole does that, but like, see, this what this what I be trying to tell y'all. Yeah, oh, about yeah. Hey, he's got the toughest gig in the world because any any other place in the league, like, like he's not playing with this, like, yo, we got Steph Curry, and <laughs> this is who you're supposed to be like. <laughs> and he's right, like the right. complete opposite. Like, he's like, nah, dude, I, I'm, I'm swinging out here. I got, like, you can't tell me nothing. Mario <laughs> Chalmers. He's like, what is a Dwayne Wade to Mario Chalmers? Right. right? Like, like, what are you talking right. about? I'm good here. And, and it's always wild to watch Steph with it. Because we've uh, me and uh, Vinny Goodwill were talking about this on my pod last week. Just like the colossal respect that Steph Curry commands without having to tear stuff up or right. any of those things. But man, Steph was throwing mouthpiece in that. Oh, yeah, but he threw the mouthpiece to Jordan Poole, took that shot, and he got a tech, and he couldn't – he got he so mad at Jordan Poole, he got a tech for it. And I can just only imagine – He got ejected. Him. He got right. ejected because right. it bounced some, into the crowd. some shit that Jordan Poole did. <laughs> I would love to know what Steph Curry actually thinks of Jordan Poole. Like, I don't think there's anybody in the NBA that could make more money writing, like, a real steel memoir after he gets out to Steph Curry. Like, if we oh. finally got Steph Curry If he just all, told what he really thought, right, right. not like – Everybody, to... yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, hey, that's a, that's the play right there. If you Steph, I mean, ideally, obviously, if you listen to Steph, you should have me write that book. But otherwise, you already, if you you already do... had your shot. <laughs> I yeah. ain't had a one to both talk about. That's the one we want right there. <laughs> have you guys seen that? I think it was on Apple Plus. I could be wrong. Maybe it's Hulu. But there's a uh, Sasha Jenkins did a Louis Armstrong documentary. Mm -mm. No, um, it's really really good. I recommend checking it out. But. It's based largely on these audio tapes that. Oh yes, I had heard. Yes, right, 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 right. But what was interesting about it is, as I watched it, I remembered. I want to say it was about thirty years ago that the New York Times had gotten a hold of the audio tapes, and they were going through and just talking about what these thoughts of Louis Armstrong, you know, what his private thoughts were, and they found out two things that they were not expecting. Number one. Louis Armstrong, re well, three things. Number one, Louis Armstrong really liked smoking weed. Number two, Louis Armstrong found it very important to take laxatives and make sure your regularity was straight. And number three, and this broke a lot of hearts, oh boy, Louis Armstrong was frustrated with the white man. So like all that Louis Armstrong they had seen with the smile and the horn and everything else, man, they got on them tapes. And Louis Armstrong was taking them he white like folks. Like your grandmama in church, you just start cursing, right? Yes, he was taking them white folks. He, to he like one of them Disney workers, huh? Smiling <laughs> face in the break room. They like I can't stand these kids. No, and that's what I feel like. We get like the the, the real chapter of Steph's why I'm better than LeBron. Let's go. And KD. <laughs> Yes. I think, yes. I think you put that in there. And I said, oh, man, can you just – the chapter where he just start going at the old head? Right. Hold on. Hold on. The Chris Paul chapter, right? The Chris Paul where, chapter. Like, it, the, the, it ain't 2014 no more chapter. Yeah. Oh, right. man, yeah. I think he's getting close, though. He's starting to get that vibe where I'm a little too old to care. Yeah, Look, yeah. man, he has won me completely over in the way – and not like he ever – like, he wasn't under with me. But – I don't, I admit, I don't like 
the idea Steph is the nicest guy in the world. Oh, but he just likes to talk a little junk on the floor. No, 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 do it or don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. let's go all the way in on this. I don't think he like, like it either. Yeah, like if you be an <laughs> asshole, be an asshole. Take it all the way, and right. I can make you rock with you. But I'm not, I'm not trying to do both things. I've told y'all both this. It was game four in Boston. He had one of them shots and did that. Oh, oh yeah. right yeah. there. And I was yeah. like, oh, this guy's here. This guy, oh, yeah. I rock with. Like, I'm about oh, yeah. to make this happen. Oh, he oh, gave him the night night? Oh, that's yes. it. Uh, oh, yeah. hey, no, the 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 ring third quarter. He had a 30 footer. Yes. Oh, right, right. <laughs> yes. It's like, yes. Yo, I'm like, who okay. is this dude? <laughs> like that right there, I can do. Because I admit, I got a problem with people who talk a lot of junk, but you're not allowed to fight them. Right. <laughs> right. Because you can't fight Steph. Right, right, right. Like, not that I want to see somebody fight Steph or whatever it is, but it was kind of like when Drake and Meek Mill got in that battle and Drake did his thing and Meek Mill had all the, yeah, I'm going to shoot you and da-da-da. Okay, you go shoot Drake. Right? Like, you're not getting no props for going about it oh, like no, that. Right, yeah, so yeah, Steph right, can yeah. just savage you and embarrass you and turn around in your face after he makes the shot. And there's nothing you can do. Like, luckily, he's not actually disrespectful. Right. Because then right. it'd just be like, I can't fight that. Can you imagine what would happen? It'd be happen? like if but Trey it, Young was him, right? Trey well, Young if, would if, be like, if, yeah. if Gilbert, oh, you could fight Trey Young, though. Yeah. Well, like if Gilbert Arenas, you you had Gilbert on the show, but it'd be like if Gilbert was, and Gilbert was nice. Yes. You know what I'm saying? He, But if Gilbert had rings, oh my oh, God. God. Oh, somebody would have had to fight Gilbert if Gilbert had rings. <laughs> you know but, what I mean? Like, yeah. But Trey DeBarge, yeah, somebody will fight Trey DeBarge. Right, he might right. be somebody on his own team. Right. Could be. But you ain't gonna get no street cred though. Like no, no, no. You I tell you this though, I feel like with Trey Young, you might get some cred around the league from your peers. Yeah, right. right, right. Like all, all of them, hey, what little that, man that they, coaches association might be doing, huh? yeah, like what little man are they all trying to put a battery in his back so he can go fight Trey Young? Right, right. They can't do it, right? Like, like is Tyrese Maxey too big? Right, like who, who's the who's the? There's got to be some little chip on his shoulder, dude. Alvarado, that's the one. There you Alvarado go. There can't you wait go. to fight Trey Young. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> they have oh, to beat the finals, unfortunately. But <laughs> oh my god, that, but that's like that's that's like it would be like fighting Kareem Akbar. You know what I mean? Yes. The educated brother from the bank. Yeah, you can't. Like you can't. So step, so step. You can't. You can't, you can't get in Steph's face and do the stuff back. Like right. that's the only thing about it. He's Steph. He's so Teflon. You can't be out there. Yeah, got you, dog. What you about to do right now? But you literally can't do it. Like he, like he has his own like, like arena of yeah. Forty kind of dad joke trash talk that is humiliating because of how he's doing it. <laughs> yeah, right. but you can't turn around and do that. Like, no, but right. you me, can't pull it off. Let me tell you the thing I want to give him credit for. I talked about this before, but it's interesting, like for me to go back and look at it because I tell people all the time that Steph Curry low key saved my career. I don't know if I told you guys this, but mm. so I was working at ESPN.com, and in 2007 they let me go, and I didn't know what to do with my career, and I started doing weekend radio at the local station. And they came in one day in March and they're like, oh, yeah, we got you guys credential for the tournament. And so the first two weekends of the tournament were in Raleigh. And that was the Steph Curry weekend yeah. of the tournament. And Davidson, right? right? Yeah. And so for my career, you know, I didn't come up in the game the way you guys did. So I didn't do nearly as much covering stuff as other people had. Right. So I'm there second row while Steph Curry is running Gonzaga out the building and then runs number two C Georgetown out the building. And I'm watching it. And the thing about it was, in retrospect, it wasn't like some fluky sort of thing where you just got lucky on three-pointers. This was one man outright dominating the competition, right? And he did it for four games through that tournament, even though they lost the last one. Dominated by himself. It wasn't smoke and mirrors. He was just so little. But we weren't at a place yet where we appreciated that the rules had changed in such a way that would allow a player his size to actually be successful. And so then he gets into the league and it becomes a legitimate all-star around like 24, 25, and then becomes superstar Steph in 2014, 2015. But even then, I feel like even though we watched him do dominant things, it felt like a quirk. Like it felt like a glitch in the matrix in a way. Like it felt like he could get hot, but it didn't feel like he was making it happen. And I think that's the line of demarcation between these players. But he made it happen at Davidson, right? It wasn't like that was a fluke. He made it happen. And now there's no denying he makes it happen. And now there's no denying without him, this is just some dudes. Like Clay Thompson <laughs> and Draymond Green are going to go to the Hall of Fame because they played with Steph Curry. You can't put those guys in any other place and we talk about them in the same way. Or like maybe we put Draymond in, but we talk about him like we talk about Bobby Jones. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but Bobby Jones still played. Off- yeah, he's half the offensive player, Bobby Jones. Right, 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 right. Bobby Jones dunk on you. But no, <laughs> but you're right. No, I mean, it's like the Bill Russell, all satellites around him, you know, are, <laughs> <laughs> share that sun. You know what I mean? Like, And there's no no hate. It's just like y'all are better because you play with this guy. You know what I mean? Like, it's the and same it's a with special Steph. skill to maximize that, too. It's a lot of dudes who are around Steph that. They didn't become. You oh, know no, no, no like, question. No, they had to have talent. Skill. Yeah, John yeah, Havlicek yeah. was a great player, but he was better playing with Bill Russell. Right? You know what well, I mean? Well, like, well, well, let me ask you guys this, because you guys are much closer to this. When they made the decision to move on from Mark Jackson, which obviously in retrospect, good call. Um, but my thought at the time was, you really think these guys can win more than 52 games? Like it felt like it felt like like where they were was pretty good and it felt greedy because they hadn't made the playoffs prior to that, or like, you know, they had been so bad for the previous 20 years outside of 07. It just seems so crazy the idea that was you not happy with what you getting here? Right. Oh, my bad. <laughs> nah, it was wild at the time. They won 51 games. 51 games. We're talking about the Warriors. We're talking about a team that right, made like two right. playoffs. The Warriors. Years. I'm like, y'all turning y'all nose up at 51 no. games? Like you, you remember that game in the Clippers series where they got the camera on Lake up and he was so sick of Mark Jackson that he's just shaking his head like, like he couldn't stay. My man showed up in black for game <laughs> seven. <laughs> Trust me. Talk about it's a black. funeral. Either theirs or mine. <laughs> I feel one of the coldest so lines. Crazy. And it just it felt it felt a little racist, you know. I remember Marcus, you had to explain to the white people about why Mark Jackson went to his church every weekend. And then we were like, <laughs> I uh, guess I guess inexperienced Steve Kerr was the right decision. Sometimes you find goals on the golf course. Who had any idea? We had, we all had to fall back. It was kind yeah, of like, we, it was like had to, we had to recalibrate. It was like the Elkins thing. You can't blame us for asking, but we can't right. ask no more. Right. No. Yeah, right. You can't there ain't no denying it, right? Like, <laughs> the the cold part, Bo, was these are the straight won a title immediately. It was like um, over LeBron, they, over they, LeBron too. Like they wanted so fast, he was already back at ESPN to call the game. Mark Jackson's not getting nearly enough credit that he sat there for four or five years calling those games. Hey, it's a, it's a. It, he should be having a TED talk. On, on, no, that's a thirty on, for thirty you know for your ass like, right hey, there. Hey, <laughs> no, right? Like, you gotta sit there and do that. That's like officiating your ex's wedding. The same way y'all <laughs> broke up. The other part on this too. Now that it's been eight years, I want to tell some people. Hey, man, ain't nobody giving that dude no job. Y'all can just move on. No, like, exactly. He, he good. He good. <laughs> They had to. Oh, they don't want to hire Mark Jackson. Do you know how hard it is to go from fifty-one wins to sixty-seven? <laughs> Man, insane, yeah, and that, 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 that is insane, though. That that is insane, and and the crazy part is, I don't think the whole time nobody knew Steph was Steph, like right, the right. entire time. One nobody person, knew. yeah, one person knew it. I mean, look, it's insane that he's what like thirty five now. Yeah, yeah, just turned thirty five. Yeah, still play the way he plays at thirty five. Again, oh, there are levels to this. Look, he did all this on LeBron's watch. Like, when this is all said and done, there's a chance we're going to have a re- – like, if LeBron James is LeBron James, is LeBron James, is LeBron James. Totally get that. And it, it's kind of a similar to a Yogi Jim B thing where LeBron is so tangibly, physically dominant in ways. And you could think about him being a two-way player. That makes it hard to put Steph up there with him. But you go look at the resume, man. Remember, we thought in 2014, LeBron went to Cleveland. They got Kevin Love to go with him and Kyrie Irving. Cancel Christmas. And they right. never got to be that. They were underdogs after the first month of that season for the rest of their whole time. Yeah. Now, this to me, the <clears throat> the parallel tough. is if you if you said after Jordan, who was the you know the next seismic player in the NBA, everybody would say Kobe, and rightly so. He's great. Kobe was great. Tim Duncan's got as many rings as Kobe Bryant, just as many. <laughs> You know what I mean? And nobody says Tim Duncan's one of the five greatest players of all time. So weird. He got five, just like Kobe did. You know what I'm saying? So I, and he got them five too. That and he got them five. <laughs> that wasn't you know what I'm saying? That that's Duncan. that's the parallel to me is that yeah, Manu was a great player. Tony Park was a great player, but don't forget, don't forget the son 
is Tim Duncan. Duncan. He's the son down there. You know, you can you can make an argument that Tim Duncan won championships as the best player on those teams 15 years apart. Yep. Do you realize how crazy <laughs> that is? And That's it, insane. Yeah, That's and crazy. after Bill Russell and Nakeem Olajuwon, quite possibly the best defensive big who yeah. ever played. It's just less flashy, but look, here's the thing. Kobe, there's an eye test element that comes with this with him, obviously. But if you read this stuff off a piece of paper and you just don't look at points per game, you will never be able to make an argument that Kobe Bryant was a better basketball player than Tim Duncan. It's just not there. No, no. And, and, and another guy, I, want to, I gotta ask you about Bo because I, 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 I sit there and think of game theory episodes. I'm like, all right, I gotta do this. They gotta. <laughs> this Luca situation, especially when you throw in, like. How many situations can you put Kyrie in and he might end up being the good guy? Like, you, were, <laughs> you were a million percent right on your tweets, by the way, about Kyrie. This is not Kyrie's fault. Stop it. He doesn't, he doesn't mess it up as soon as he gets there. Oh, right? he takes him a time. He slow yeah, plays it. When he gets there, people like him because the kids look up to him. And, and he's an excellent basketball player. Like there was a time where I thought you could argue that he was a player who didn't affect winning. I don't think that's I, I don't think that's been true honestly since he left Cleveland. Um, right. like that first year in Boston, if he had not gotten hurt that year, there's no telling how that winds up going. And then he appeared to lose his mind that next year. But yeah. this one here, they were a bad fit. You remember that game early when he first got there, and it was the last second shot, and he and Luca just kept playing hot potato with the ball because they couldn't figure out what to do. And now Luca say he's sad, and he's sad after the games. It ain't got nothing to do necessarily with the basketball stuff. Cuban has done a horrible job building around his superstars for 20 years. Like, we're going to go back and realize we sold Dirk way short. Oh, that yeah. man was asked to do oh, yeah. everything and did it. And that same thing's yep, yep. happening here. And so I'm looking at it like, so are they going to fire Jason Kidd? Because normally a disaster like this, somebody has to go and the coach would be the one that has to go. But that's the coach they got because Luca wanted him. Does Luca still want him? Um, is Luca going to be okay soon? Is he ever going to learn to play with somebody else? Is he ever going to learn to play off the ball? All those things come together, and Mark Cuban, booty all tight, just hoping that that man don't want to leave there. Clock's ticking. Clock's ticking. You know, and, and Kyrie, look, he may stay because they gave him all the money, but he may not. You know what I'm saying? So where do you do if he bounces to the Lakers next time? <laughs> like, I mean, oh, don't get me wrong. You let him go. Yeah. I mean, I don't care what nobody says. They got him for free. Like, look, Spencer Dinwiddie and Dorian Finney-Smith are players. Don't get me wrong. But they got him for that in way future draft picks. For Kyrie Irving, they yeah. basically got him for free. If it doesn't work, let him go. You can I, – I mean, are the Lakers really going to be dumb enough to sign up for years of the Kyrie experience? After they clear the decks? Yeah, that's <laughs> – We'll see. Oh my God, oh, that's such a terrible idea. Because we'll here's see. the thing, LeBron like James, bright and shiny out there. I think LeBron James has only played 70 games um, with the Lakers in the bubble season. That's it. Like you can only bet on 50 games a year of him, and you can't bet on 50 games for Kyrie, and you can't bet on 50 games for Anthony Davis. What, what if the they, they alternate gonna... the 50? The, the, uh, you got <laughs> you got 30. You got 30. <laughs> Did you see that where Mikael Bridges, Cam Johnson, and Spencer Dinwiddie have already played more games with the Nets than Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant did? That's just, that's just wild. <laughs> the new big three, baby. <laughs> oh, my God. But, I, but that's a more fun team than the one they had, and that's what's no going question. No question. No question. No question. So, Bo, what, what's, what's out there that you haven't – really sunk your teeth into yet that you go, oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get into this before. Man, so we in the trick bag. We got our season finale coming up. Uh, March 31st, the finale that comes up. And I'll tell you here, uh, we're going to call for the end of drug testing in sports. So oh. we're going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going we gonna, we gonna to hit that. The all one. Drug Olympics, my favorite oh, SNL yes, sketch of all yes. time. <laughs> but it's wild because things just like come up that I stop and think about. And I'm like, oh, man, we can probably get into this one and get into that one. Like so many of them. So like if we could get on in the right Olympic year, there's all kinds of Olympics things that I want to get into um, and that I want to talk about. I really want to get into it. We touched on this a little, but we haven't gone super deep, which is, the NBA, like we losing the recipes, dog. It's I mean, with with the big Vic coming in and with the guys who are at the top of the league now, I just need to understand how in the world it is that the pipeline of American basketball players has gotten so dry. 
and has been there for a while. Like, if you look at the best players under 25, after you get past Ja and uh, Zion, it ain't long before you get to Tyrese Halliburton. And that's not an insult to Tyrese Halliburton, but that's not a, this isn't the discussion we're supposed to have. It's him not in. a compliment for American right. basketball, that's right. for sure. No, right. no, like I think this young man Scoot, um, yeah. that nickname is not letting you know what's going on, by the way. Like for those of you who keep hearing about this Scoot Henderson and thinking like you got like Tiny Archibald, no, no, no. He's Scoot <laughs> if if trains scooted. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a mountain scooted, huh? Right? Like a bold the way a boulder scoots down the side of a hill. <laughs> like, 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 where was your growth spurt, homie? Like, who ever thought that calling you scoot was a good idea? Is it like calling Debo tiny? You know, is this supposed to be exactly. ironic? Is that right? Right. So, like, that's right. one I want to get into. There's all kinds of NFL stuff that I'd love to get into. Like this Lamar Jackson thing. I wish I had like two dude, minutes to talk dude. about this right now because it's fascinating. I am so like I cannot figure this one out. Like, I'm like, y'all are the most avaricious, result oriented, greedy MFers in the history of the world. Yes. And this guy can get it for you. And you won't take them. You won't cite them. I don't understand. So this How is what, that possible? This is what I think they're messing up on. And so, like, you know, we've all been doing this media thing for a while. And we've done it at different points that have allowed us to do little TV, radio, whatever it is at points, make some side checks, get a little money that we haven't been able to sit on, right? If we lost our jobs today, we couldn't just like live forever without a job necessarily, right. but we'd be all right. Right. Like, I know this is going to come back around. Lamar Jackson could get paid $32 million to take the franchise tag, but he don't need that money. Yeah. It would be nice to have, but he doesn't need that money, which is to say they need a quarterback. More than he needs. More than he needs money. 32 million. Yeah. yeah. I, and I don't think people understand that part. They're like, oh, he ain't going to walk away from 32. That 32 ain't going nowhere. Right. It's right. Still going to be there, but I don't have to take. That's my worst case scenario right now. It's, it's my 32. floor. Yeah. Right. And so the Ravens, however, you got mini camps coming up. You got to figure out what you're going to do with draft stuff. You're going to stink without him. Not only are you going to stink without him, it's going to hurt you if you don't get him back by June because you need to get him in the fold. You got a new offensive coordinator, all of this stuff. Sorry, guys, you don't have the leverage. And so there are things that our bosses could bring to us that we just be like, no, nah, I'm good. The other people who are new in the game can't say no to because they need to get those checks. Somebody's like, he's not rolling in dough. That dude's made like millions of dollars already on the field, plus whatever he got off the field. He don't look like he out here blowing his cash. I want nothing more than him to just sit there and be like, fine, do it without me. I'll be right here waiting on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Let me know. Like, we all remember this one. You remember that time Jerry Jones ain't want to pay Emmitt Smith? <laughs> Two games. And he, and he had to Two go games. out there and get embarrassed. Two games. Two games. <laughs> Two games. It was like, <laughs> oh, you got me. You twist my arm. You twist my arm. And that's a running back. What they going to do, man? Right. Like, right. like I, I just can't believe that we're so beat down as, like, laborers in this society that we can't recognize that it is actually Lamar Jackson who has the leverage because he actually has the more valuable commodity, which is himself. A running back, a linebacker, whatever. You go get another one of those. You can't go get another one of these. The odd part is Baltimore wins by doing this, but it feels like they're they're trying to take a stand for the entire league. Why are you trying to give exactly them a, what they, you know? What, what are you standing for them you? for? Yeah. Right, like, they're trying to beat them. <laughs> but but here's what I don't understand. I don't understand why Baltimore is doing that. But Mr. Aldridge coming around your city, yeah. They yeah. are running Dan Snyder out of the NFL as we speak. Now, I understand yeah. you don't necessarily want to put $250 million on your balance sheet, right? Like, you don't right. want to have to take that 250 in cash and put it in escrow. It yeah. doesn't make your team look as good when you sell it. However, if you want to flip the middle finger to your colleagues oh, yeah, that's on the way out yeah, of the door, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the way yeah. to do no it. No question. No yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. question. Why don't you do, why don't yes. you do that? I don't understand. Yes. It, it's literally, this is what I literally think it is. He just doesn't have the scratch. He doesn't have it. <laughs> You don't have it. 
You know, this would be the most Dan Snyder. Movie it would be ever. the most Dan Snyder thing of all time. <laughs> Trade five, even five first round picks. I don't work here no more. Trade them all. He just don't have it. You don't have the es- you don't have the money to put in escrow for that. That's that's the only reason he's not doing it. <laughs> and to me, though, I think that's a big holdup of this for all these guys in the league. Like when Khalil Mack left the Raiders, for example, the question was, did they have the money to put it in escrow? There are questions in Cincinnati about some of the moves they're making, like finally selling the naming rights to the right. stadium. Right. Because you gotta have we that. We got to money. pay Joe. <laughs> we gotta to pay Joe. <laughs> and and Mike Brown is cheap as he is. Somebody explain to him you can't do it with this the dude that reused yeah. jock oh. straps. Yeah. They told him, no, 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 no. Not with Joe. Not with Joe. You better they pay love, Joe. They love that man. We all love Joe Burrow. Right. There, is, there is no Joe Burrow is has worked his way on both sides of the aisle in Beloved. every way. Beloved, you <laughs> brothers listen, love Joe. Like, it's been a long time since we've seen a figure do this too, right? Like, right. <laughs> no, right. Joe Burrow was in New York like last week on Good Morning America talking about food insecurity, which he talked about when he got his Heisman he got trophy. Yeah. Oh, Heisman, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you you, you all good with me? I saw yeah. Joe play one game early in that season at LSU, and I just remember being like, "Oh, guys." If they beat Alabama, he's winning the Heisman. He's the number one pick because all I saw was a blonde-headed white dude that looked like he could play a little bit. Then I watched more and listened more and was like, oh, yeah, and I'm totally on board with it's everything done. that's going on. It's over. It's over. <laughs> like, it's it, yeah, people, black dudes is offering up their daughters. Like, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to bring one home, bring home Joe. And Joe, the Once he changed his like- name in that game, and he – he spelled his name like you know New Orleans yes. sound. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and, and he the only one that like dabbles in like black fashion cool without yeah. seeming like he's being facetious. Right. Yeah. No, it looks like it's genuine. A tough play, Bo. Like it's you know, so all these dudes is out here trying to do this is not pulling it off, right? Like, <laughs> like it, it's tough. To, like he does it really well. Where it's like, you know what? All right. Otherwise, you you know, you just like some like suburban rapper who's too hard. Right, right, like, yeah. right, right. Like Travis Kelsey can go too far, right? Joe Burrow never even gets close to that line. He's like no, safe, great, and sorry, baby. Man, he is great at it. He's great at it. It's game theory with Bomani Jones. I, I think I've told you this, Bo, but you always remind me of the story Chris Rock tells. He told it in the book about Saturday Night Live when he got hired, when he and Adam Sandler got hired and they went to Lauren Michaels' office and they said, you know, we don't do characters. We don't do impersonations. Why did you hire us? And Lauren Michaels said, I hired you two guys because of original thought. And I've always thought about that with you. Like you are doing this thing that nobody else is doing with your mind and this is the this is what this is what it's supposed to be like that what you're doing is what it's supposed to be let's all kind of come up with something that's ours and you're doing that in your own space and it's brilliant and i cannot congratulate you enough on the success you've had because you've went out and got it and it's yours it's not anything else other than you it's you (laughs) and and where did you go to college Clark Atlanta University. There you go. <laughs> What's our model? I'll find a way or make one. Oh, and, you I, go. and I appreciate y'all because, like, the one thing I, I can say this is, you know, you get tired, you look back on and remember it. So the thing that people have to understand about me is I came from the journalism game outside the journalism game. And so one day I just showed up. Like I just had bylines on ESPN.com and I started showing up on listservs for the International Association of Black Journalists and everything else. And I do recall it was a good two, two and a half year period that went from who the fuck does he think he is to, oh, okay. That's right. Yeah, gotcha, you go. gotcha, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I watched right. it happen. Dave is cool. He was one of them. It was a lot of people just trying to figure out like what is going on. But I, it was me. It was just who I hey. happened to be. I ain't know what else to do. And I had to yeah, get Yeah, you jobs. know who he was? You know who Bo was? Jordan right. Poole. <laughs> <laughs> hold on now. Hold on now. I'm a lot better at my job. Than Jordan Poole, so. like, 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 there was a, like, there was a, there was a, but I think the thing that was, the only thing I look back on that that was so interesting, though, and there was no way for people to get this, is like the ridiculous reverence I had for so many people that were in this space. Like, it was for me a full on understanding that I got an opportunity to go back and forth with like some Titanic figures in this industry who have clearly like opened this up. But just no way for you to know that when this dude just firing off emails because he ain't got nothing to do because he just got laid off. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> like, it don't make right. no sense. So the encouragement and support that I've ultimately gotten from so many people in the industry, particularly 
the black people in this industry because y'all don't know we got to go through a lot in order to make this happen it's always a thing that i've sincerely appreciated because i did not get it the same way everybody else did and i had to earn the respect of a lot of people for some unconventional channels so for me it was always a great victory to have earned even if it was just a little bit of that from guys like y'all so i appreciate that greatly Man, listen, it, it, it's great. It's great. It's a great show. It's great. So even, uh, especially when you disagree, that's when it's the best. Because you always go, yeah, but that's a good point, Bo, man. <laughs> yeah, and I go back and forth on that, right? <laughs> like, like, it's like, okay, you got me. Like, is everyone think about it? And that's always appreciated about that group by and large. Hey, man, if somebody got you, they got you. It happened. Right. Not that big a deal. All they right. got you, yep. All right, Appreciate leave that five-star review, y'all. Five stars on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get this fine American podcast. Marcus, my bro, if they can't leave the five stars, what do they need to do? Keep it to yourself, you haters. We're going to have Bomani do a whole episode just dragging you on Game Theory. <laughs> <laughs>